Hi, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about some deep stuff. I'm here to tell you that you're amazing. And often, the only person who can't see that is you. No matter who you are, what you do, or where you're from, there's greatness in you. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayed, life, business, and relationship coach, and welcome to the Transformation Starts Today podcast, where I interview leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life as they share their stories, the lessons they've learned along the way, and empowering perspectives to help you create an extraordinary life without regret starting today. Today, we have the pleasure of being with my friend and brother, a champion for men everywhere, Kevin McNee. Kevin is a conscious integration coach and masculine mentor. He is a warrior of the heart that leads with openness, connection, and presence. Kevin consciously guides men to look internally to find the answers that they've been searching for externally and break free of old stories, patterns, and beliefs. Kevin founded and leads a men's group called Warriors of the Heart, where he creates a safe space to allow men to open up, share their stories, and support one another in brotherhood. Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Uh, doing great. It's kind of like uh, one of those things where um, asking somebody how they're doing, my first response is like, good, you? <laughs> you yeah. know, and that's that's kind of like like what it was. And, and uh, you know, it's it's funny because there's, yeah, I'm, I'm doing great in so many ways, but then also have the have the challenges and others. So I would say for the most part, I'm doing pretty great. I, I, before we even dive into the, the conversation, <laughs> I, I, wanna, I wanna speak to that. That's wonderful. Especially in the context of our conversation today. I think that so often, you know, this applies to men and women, but spe- I mean, spe- being a man, I can only really speak to my own experience. There's this almost like unspoken expectation that you're supposed to just say, oh, I'm fine. I'm good. You versus you might be dying inside. You have all this stuff going on and you think that nobody cares or they don't really want to know. And it's so amazing that once we open, and I'm sure we're going to get into that, but once we open Mm -hmm. up, we're actually willing to say, you know what, maybe I'm going through some challenges right now. Hey, you know, I'm figuring things out. I appreciate you asking. Uh, I just need a few minutes or something like that. Yeah. It's like, you know, one time uh, I was asked that and I said, do you really want to, do you really want to know the truth or do you just want me to say good? Mm. And there, you know, there, it was actually my dad that asked me that after my separation. And I, and he was just like, took a pause and said, I wouldn't have asked if I didn't want to know. Beautiful. And that led into it. Right. So I just kind of like laid it all out there and here's what I'm going, going through. And, and yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty powerful. Yeah. And just to that point for everyone listening, and I get that sometimes, you know, you don't necessarily have the the space or the time for what I'm about to suggest, but going forward, just imagine how different your relationships could be. If every time you ask someone how they're doing, you're not just asking out of like a formality to kind of open the conversation, but you actually want to know. And if you were to ask that, it might lead to a five minute, 30 second, three hour conversation. (laughs) But mm-hmm. that can, the depth that you go to, that that opens up when you create that space is amazing. And so before we get started, I would love to just set an intention for today. Absolutely. Today, I'd love for us to provide a space for men to see that they're not alone in what they're experiencing, that there's a way through whatever they're feeling as they move towards creating the life that they'd love to live. And also for all the women that are with us today, for them to better be able to understand the men in their lives. How does that sound to you? That sounds, uh, that sounds absolutely perfect. Perfect, man. So for my listeners who don't know you, they haven't heard your story. I found that each of us has what I call a hero story. You know, we're the yeah. hero of our own adventure. And we've experienced challenge and setbacks and adversities along the way, things that we've overcome to get to where we are now. If you could please share with us, what is your hero story? As, as you're talking about that and I, I was just trying to think of like, what, what would be my hero story? And the first thing that comes to me was like, um, you know, feeling like I was living a life smaller than I had dreamed, mm-hmm. you know, like feeling like I was forced to, to play small. Like I'd, I'd, 
I'd achieved so much in my life. I was a golf professional. Um, I reached a high level in sports like that uh, with curling in, in Canada is, a, is mainly a Canadian sport that not a whole bunch of people from the U.S. know about, but, um, you know, reached a, a high level in that and, and was quite successful. And, and when I transitioned out of the golf industry into business, again, you know, worked hard, reached that high level of success, because that was supposed to be what was going to make me fulfilled and happy. And, and that success is what you're supposed to feel and be as a man. And when I reached that, you know, having, you know, the $200,000 a year job, the, the big fancy house, the, the nice vehicles in the driveway, money in the bank. I'm like, why do I feel so small? Mm -hmm. right so I guess my hero story was like it kind of goes twofold where I thought I was being the hero because I was succeeding in any area that I put my focus into but it was all in areas that was just for the outside shell instead of you know turning my direction towards inside going why do I still feel so empty and it wasn't until you know my my hero journey started, I would say in 2013, when I, when I visited my, uh, my first experience as it with an energy healer. Mm. And, uh, you know, I just went in and went in for a Reiki session and, and just kind of to, to see what it was all about. Cause I had all of these questions and, and, you know, the, within the first five minutes, it was like, my life was changed, you know, and, and started to look more inside and and how can I be a better person because there's more to life than just the outside stuff and although that that helps you you know feel better and, and live a, a better life with with the money and and the things and, and stuff like that they're only additions to what's truly supposed to be fulfilling inside and if you wouldn't mind can you open up and expand on the difference that you see between succeeding in the external and succeeding in the internal well, it was like, uh, for me, is, is I was really attached to that um, persona of being, you know, I was, I was the golf pro and I was, you know, that's who I was, right? I wasn't Kevin McNee, the person who was enough being who he was, just being a good person and, and you know, being respectful and kind and, and, you know, smiling and laughing with other people. That wasn't enough if I wasn't like the best golfer. Or, you know, took my game to the next level. Or when I switched into like oil and gas and in business, um, I wasn't enough just, you know, being the best that I could. I needed that validation from others, from my boss, from, you know, my clients, financially, from, you know, from outside sources to bring that towards me. And that's kind of like, that's what I mean by, you know, that finding that success and, and whatnot outside myself, as opposed to, you know, just being able to let that go and look inside and go, wow, I'm actually enough. And I feel enough without that stuff. Everything else is just a, you know, it's a bonus and an add on in my life. Love that. There's a distinction that's coming to me that I'd love to share for people. Cause sometimes you have this idea of being enough, right? Mm. There's kind of, I look at it in two ways. One is who you are and one is who you're being. And so from that perspective, everyone listening, who, you're, who you are, in my perspective, you are whole, perfect and complete. You're not only enough, you're more than enough. And from the perspective of who you're being, you probably can be doing better. Mm -hmm. and, and it's this balance of, you at like the level of your essence, you might call that your soul or your spirit or just, you know, life itself, whatever you call that, that essence of who you are, enough doesn't even make sense. Like you are, like you're perfect. But from how you show up in the world, think about all the different roles, you know, for the men listening, maybe you're a father, you know, you're definitely a son. Maybe you're a leader, you know, maybe you're your friend, but whatever roles that you're playing, if 10 is the best you possibly could be showing up, where are you at? If you could give yourself that mm -hmm. honest estimation and for the ladies listening, by all means, you know, the roles that you're in, if 10 is the best that you could be, where are you at? And there's no shaming. There's no blaming. There's no guilt. If you're a three, you're a three own it. 
and say, well, how can I be doing better? And there's just that like um, interesting mix of fully accepting who you are, but then recognizing, yeah, you know, compared to the life I, I'm capable of, maybe I'm falling short of that. And it's nothing mm-hmm. to do with who I am. It has to do with the actions that I'm taking and not taking. Yes. And, you know, uh, one word that came through as you were talking is honest. It's like being honest with yourself. It's the hardest thing to do, to look yourself in the mirror and go, you know what? I'm not showing up. I'm not showing up at 100% of my potential. And I know that. But actually being honest with yourself, and I got goosebumps thinking about it, is like, when you get there and realize that you can do better and it's up to you, that can be a scary feeling and it can, you know, be frustrating and, and hard to think about. It's like, Oh man, I got to put in this extra work. But that's also the exciting part because it's like, you get to decide. Yeah. You put the work in, you're going to benefit. That's like the best thing that you can do. It's just like, instead of thinking of it as a negative that you, you know, that maybe you think you have to do this work instead of, it's like, I get to do this work and I get to also benefit from it. Yeah. When you talked about the fear, you know, it brought up in my mind, this idea of ownership or responsibility. And when we come from the space of not blaming, you know, when we, in my, in my mind, when we blame, I often tell my clients, when you blame another person or whatever the situation is, for how you feel on the inside, you're basically mm-hmm. like exporting your power. You're exporting the control over your emotional and mental well being. But when you can slow down and say, Is my life as it currently stands the way I want it to be? Do I love it? And if the answer is no, if you take the ownership and say, Not a fault again or a blame or a shame, but you take that mm-hmm. ownership and say, I'm willing to do something about this. And then you start taking new action. It's incredible what you, when the input changes, the output changes. But if we're just thinking about it, man, you know, I'm not happy. I don't know what's going on, but we keep acting the same way. Nothing's mm-hmm. going to change. And like you said, it can be scary. It can be frightening. It can be frustrating. But once we have that internal shift and then we follow it up with action, it's incredible. Life can change so fast. Totally. And it's like, you know, one thing that comes up and I've heard this term is like radical responsibility right? And that's taking responsibility for your part in all areas of your life, whether it's your relationship, whether it's your job, whether it's, you know, your health and fitness, you have a part in that, right? So take responsibility, accept that, and then take action. But also what comes along with that is, is for me, the way that it showed up is I started to take responsibility for all of it. Yeah. You know, um, taking responsibility for for my ex wife's part or for my my um, employer's part too, and going, you know, I worked with a coach here a few months ago, and she was like, "No, no, you take responsibility for your part, but you don't get you don't need to take responsibility for everyone else's part." And uh, you know, a saying that comes up is like, "It's up to me to clean up my side of the street, but it's up to you to clean up your side." And to that point, for everyone listening, it's, it's a really simple yet powerful and insightful question. If you're open to it, if you can check the ego at the door, let's say you're in, a, you're in a, an argument with a partner of yours, you got into a fight, or maybe something's just not going well in your interpersonal relationships, or you don't like where you're at in your life right now, that simple question is, what part am I playing in this? How did I mm-hmm. create this? And when we can take that ownership and say, you know, Maybe my partner is really frustrated with me and the ego is going, well, that's got nothing to do with me. Like he or she, they're losing their, their mind and, and that's not on me. Yeah, yeah, but what? how did you kind of create that experience? Because no one just loses their mind. No one just gets mad. There's mm-hmm. a wrap up period and there's something you did and didn't do. There's a way you were showing up in the world or didn't show up in the world that led to that, you know, their experience. And even though, again, like you said, we're not responsible for their experience, but at least take the ownership because as thin as you can slice it, there's always two sides. hundred percent. You know what? Um, you can be with, with a, with a partner in a relationship where your partner is being an asshole for years and years and years. But if you're not saying anything or speaking up to that, that was me. Yeah. That's my responsibility for not 
speaking up to that, for allowing it and accepting that and not setting that boundary and taking, you know, holding myself accountable, being like, you know what? I don't like this. I don't feel good in this situation. I'm not going to allow it and I'm going to stop it. That would have, that was up to me. And yeah, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a continuous like learning, learning curve until you're ready. Right. It reminds me of just that simple expression, you know, people aren't mind readers. And if we can come from that space of saying, like you said, something's bothering me. Have I brought it up? Mm -hmm. There's something I really want. I'd love to see this more. I'd love to have this done more. I'd love all these different things more. This would be a wonderful, this would be exciting. Have you shared that? Have you expressed it? And we often, if we don't, we have stories about why, oh, I'm afraid they're not going to take it well, this, that, that. And I get it. You know, I, I can understand where that fear comes from. And at the same time, like you said, if you keep it in your mind, nothing's going to change. They're probably going to keep doing the thing that you either don't like, or they're not going to do the thing that you'd like them to do more. That's right. Essentially, you're teaching them that it's okay to behave the way that, you're, that they are because you're allowing it. So they're not doing anything wrong. They're just doing exactly what you're allowing. So it's just like, oh, wow. Um, part of that's my part in it, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, was a, it was a tough learning curve. And I, I feel like I was a, maybe a little bit of a slow learner, but, uh, you know, in due time, I suppose. Yeah. And so when you were sharing your story, you know, from golf to business and you know, everywhere in between, when you were in some of your darker moments, your more challenging moments, moments of fear, frustration, insecurity, things like that, what helped you through it? What did you remind yourself of? Like, what were those moments of inspiration that really just made a big difference? Um, you know, the, the thing that really comes to me, Jamil, is, is just continuing to show up with whatever, like whatever I had, um, I was, you know, in, in 2015, 2016, I was like completely overwhelmed with work and just the more that I, that I tried to work and the, the harder that I worked and the more that I put into it, it just seemed like you, you couldn't catch up. I couldn't catch up. Um, the more that I put into my relationship, it just, it was the things that, that I didn't do that got noticed. And I just, you know, I did keep showing up. I tried doing the same things, but just more of it. And it, it kind of brings up that saying, like uh, Albert Einstein saying is like, if you keep doing the same things over and over, expecting a different result is the definition of insanity, mm -hmm. right? So I started to make changes and my health was, was decreasing. Um, I was the heaviest that I had ever been at like 250 pounds. Uh, I was smoking and lying about it mm -hmm. behind people, behind my wife's back, behind everybody's back. And I decided that I was going to quit. And I started running because I knew that when I ran, I didn't want to eat bad and I didn't want to smoke. So I was like, I enjoyed running when I was younger. So I just started doing that. And the, the, the more that I did that, the more results I started to feel, I started to feel better. I started to look better. I started to like, you know, connect with, with nature and connect with, with myself and have the, that, those moments of clarity, but then I'd go back to my life. Right. And it'd be like super hard and I'd go to run and I'm like, Oh man, I feel so good in this. But essentially I was just like kind of running away from my problems. Mm. Right. Yeah. Until it showed up to where, you know, I had to, I had to face them. If I wanted to truly get somewhere while I was running, I had to face the problems when I wasn't. So it was, uh, I guess a long winded answer to your question just kept showing up. You know, every day I woke up and I showed up trying to do the best that I could. Um, even on the outside, it didn't look, it might not have looked like it from, uh, you know, from a lot of others. Yeah. Yeah. And What's coming to mind now, and it goes with what you just said, for anyone listening, they're experiencing, you know, their version of what you went through. They maybe have achieved a certain level of success from the eyes of society. But like you mm -hmm. said, maybe there's that empty feeling. There's that feeling of, I don't feel successful. There's what, maybe they're not communicating well with their partner. They're having issues there. But their version of what you went through, is there a message that you have for them? Something that you think could help? Yeah, it doesn't like the outside image doesn't have to be a reflection of 
of who you are. And that was, and that was it. Like when, when I separated from my wife in the way that it happened, you know, being that I went outside my marriage, um, I had uh, many people in our small town come up to me and they're like, I just, I don't get it. Like, I thought you guys were the perfect couple. You had the, you know, you had everything going for you, the family, the, the things, the job, the career, like all of that stuff. They're like, I had to go back and check in with my wife and be like, are we good? And I was like, well, I said, I just got really good at hiding it and wearing them, wearing the mask of, you know, that persona, having it all together on the outside but feeling empty and hurt and struggling on the inside. If you can elaborate on that, especially, you know, given the aspect or the intention for our show today, for the men who are listening, who are wearing that mask mm. and they're, re they're really good at hiding it, they've built up that skill. What's the cost of doing that? Oh man, it's everything, right? It, it's 100% everything. And I just look, it's, it's your life, right? essentially putting on that mask, I was not even living my life. I was living someone else's life, right? That mask of, I read a book called uh, Why Good People Do Bad Things by Debbie Ford. And it's, it was an absolute game changer for me. And it talked about the masks of the wounded ego. And I got, I flipped it open and it came right to the nice guy. Mm -hmm. And I read the nice guy and that was me to a T and I get emotional thinking about it. I'm like, man, that it talked about the challenges that the nice guy has, the way that he acts, the shames, and what what results in in his him showing up as the nice guy. And it was like, you know, that was my life. And I was like, man, it's uh, it's definitely time for some changes. So, yeah, I think that expression, the nice guy, is severely misunderstood <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, like in my experience there's a big difference between let's say being nice and being kind so you might want to be the kind guy but a lot of people think the nice guy is this kind of shy meek not stand up for himself kind of lacking confidence and pretending to be you know what he thinks the world wants him to be and like you mm -hmm. said that's not going to work for you in terms of your long-term fulfillment. That's not going to work for you in terms of attracting a partner who's going to love you for you. Cause they don't know you because you're, mm -hmm. you're hiding. You're behind the mask. Like you said, that's right. Yeah. Being the nice guy, you know, is, is essentially um, living with an expectation. Hey, if I'm nice, I'm going to get treated. Well, I'm going to receive what I want. The, the love, the affection, the abundance, as long as I'm nice. But that nice guy persona means I'm going to bury my words. I'm going to bury my thoughts, my emotions, how I feel. But that only goes for so long. So like I would go play golf and hit a bad shot and absolutely lose my mind. Or, you know, go play hockey in like a fun league and absolutely smash somebody and go, what the hell was that? You know, where is this coming from? Even though I'm like, oh, I'm not having the conversations that I need to have. I'm feeling this way inside, but I'm burying that. You know, like that, that one thing that comes to my head is like sitting there going, oh man, I wish I would have said that in that conversation. Or I wish I would have done this. You know, if I would have just said that, I'd, I'd feel at least like I stood up for myself. And reflecting on all of those situations and going, huh, that's where that's showing up in my life. And it's, it's uh, completely destructive. Yeah. What's coming up for me now, this idea that, and you, and you inspired it, you know, the nice guy so often, he may not even be doing this at times consciously, but he's being nice from the perspective of trading. And like, like you said, I'm going to be nice to get what I want. One example that comes to me that I've seen a lot of people try to do, which it never works out for them is they'll be nice, let's say, in their intimate relationship with the expectation they're going to receive something in return, whether it be sex or intimacy or anything like that. Mm. And, from, and then when it doesn't happen, they get frustrated. But one of the reasons it doesn't happen is because they never ask for what they want. They just assume that if they're being nice, it will be reciprocated in the way that they want it to be, which goes back to that mind reading thing. 
And then, like you said, that frustration builds and builds and builds. And then there's almost that internal dialogue. I don't get it. Like I'm being so nice. Why is this not happening? Why is that not happening? Mm -hmm. And then somebody like yourself or myself might talk to them and say, well, what do you want? And they first might not even be clear about it, but let's say they are. Have you asked for it? Well, no. And it's like, well, what actions have you taken to move toward it? I'm kind of waiting. Like they're in kind of a uh, passivity. And it's like that leads to that frustration. But if you can kind of put the, take the hat off of the nice guy, get grounded in that kind of masculine presence, that essence that is yours, Mm -hmm. ask for what you want, share, you know, from your heart respectfully, listen deeply, hold that space. And kind of go back and forth with whoever it is you're communicating with and the chances of you getting what you want are astronomical. Absolutely. It's just like, um, as men, we're told that vulnerability is weakness and showing emotion, like, you know, be a man, toughen up, right? Whereas being vulnerable and saying like, this is how I feel, right? This is what I need to feel loved. This is what I want for you know, to feel like I'm enough and worthy. What happens if you actually say that? You might just get it, right? But it's the fear of looking weak by saying that and being like, you know what? I don't have it all together. I'm, I'm actually struggling because I'm not having sex with my wife or my partner. And that makes me feel like I'm not enough, like I'm unworthy, like I'm you know, the, uh, the little boy that used to get teased for being fat on the playground in elementary school. You know, that's where I go. That's where I would go to and be like, huh, this is where that's showing up. So now all of a sudden outside validation comes in or, you know, you start getting noticed by other things and that starts to be the temptation. But realistically, like you said, to go back to it, If I would have just said, this is how I feel. This is what I need. This is what I want. Whether I got it or not, maybe I would have. But even if I didn't, I at least know where my relationship stands and I could make a decision from there. Yeah. And when you talked about how a lot of us grow up with this perception, vulnerability is weakness. You know, don't, don't, don't show emotion. Don't cry. Like you said, be Mm -hmm. a man, like that kind of stuff. And for everyone listening, you know, kind of taking for a moment, the coach hat off, putting my medical hat on, when you suppress emotion for a long period of time, you know, a lot of men, years, decades, you got stuff that's been bottling up and you keep pushing it back down. And then something really big happens for you in an emotional sense, and you try to hold it in and not let it out and you keep burying it. What that does to you over time is cancer, disease. Things mm. happen, they manifest in that physical realm. I've seen that over and over and over again. And you can prevent it from most of the time, if you, depending on obviously what the cause is, you could prevent it most of the time from the mental emotional side, if that is one of the primary drivers, by just releasing it. Think of it, I was in uh, Hawaii not too long ago. And on the big island, there's a volcano there that's active. And what my mentor there, my teacher was telling me, well, there's kind of different kinds of volcanoes. There's like a Mount Vesuvius or like a Mount St. Helen that just kind of looks normal and then it just blows its top one day because the pressure has been building and building and building and then it just explodes. That would be the equivalent of you just suppress, you suppress, you suppress, and then you go from thinking, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, and then, oh my God, I got this medical condition, right? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I just like attacked or hit my kid or my wife or I verbally assaulted or something like that. And then, like you said, oh my God, you know, in sports, like, where did that come from? Like, where did that aggression come from? The other kind of volcano, you know, in this example, there's two, there might be more, but the one in Hawaii, it's consistently erupting lava, but it's not like you'd seen a movie where it's like, you know, going into the sky, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's coming up and it's going right off the side into the ocean and that relieves the pressure. So in that same kind of way, it never has that opportunity to really build up and blow at the top. So what would happen if you say, you know what, here's this kind of, preface I have vulnerability is weakness how's that working for you and you sit with that question and you go it's not really working at all like I'm getting frustrated I don't feel good about myself and it's like I really want to like and we'll get to this in a moment but I want to have some people I can talk to about this 
Mm-hmm. And so when we can come from that space and say, all right, well, if it's not working for me, what's the alternative? One possibility is that vulnerability slash authenticity is strength. And when you can come from that space of saying, you know what? Emotional maturity is part of that mature masculine, like let's say that embodied king, that version of you at your best. Yeah. And that version of you might say, hey, this is what I'm feeling right now. Why is that? And let me dive into that. What's the frustration? What's the unmet expectation? Like you said earlier, when I, when I introduced you, what's your story that you're living into that's not really working for you? What are you needing from your partner, from, your, from, from work? Like maybe you're not feeling respected or appreciated. Maybe you got someone who keeps bad mouthing you, but you never said anything. And like you say, if you don't say anything, you know, people treat you in a way, the way you train them to treat you because you let them know what you're willing to put up with. And so all that happens and we've got a lot of, I forgot where I heard this, but I love the meta, the, like the visual, you've got a lot of little boys in adult male bodies. And I say that. And I say that with love and respect for every man who's listening to this, but it's like, there's, there's three different versions. There's boys, there's guys, and there's men. And when we can really get clear on where we're at, no shame on that, but am I acting like a boy? Like you said, if I was picked on when I was a kid or something like that, is that version of me that still has all those emotional insecurities that never spoke up, is he still driving the show? Even if I'm like 20, 30, 40 years older? Mm-hmm. And if he is, you can shift that and you can take back control and now act the way you'd like to act as the man that you want to be in this world, as the man you want to be remembered by, as the partner you want to be, as the father you want to be, as all these kind of things. But I'm going to pause there. And I'm going to go back to you. <laughs> well, something, you know, like, like uh, I guess something that, that just popped into my head as you were talking is like, what's the story that comes into your mind? When someone tells you no, like if somebody, if somebody says no to you or just, you know, tells you no, what, what's your response or reaction? And something, you know, something for me is just like, well, how can they say no to me? You know, this is, you know, whatever the reaction is, is like, is most likely where that maturity is, is at. And a lot of times we act like the little boys that, you know, need the love or, or didn't receive that, or, or it takes us back to like, oh, he said no. So that means that I'm not worthy or that I'm not enough, or, you know, they want to have somebody better or do something better. They are, they're going to, they're going to, whatever story that, that comes up, it's like, what happens, what happens when somebody says no to you, whatever that reaction is, is uh, it's a powerful one. And that's a reflection that I, that I ask my clients too. I love that. You know, um, I often tell people in that similar kind of train of thought, people who say I was rejected, right? So it's like, no, actually just means no. Rejection (laughs) is the story that we make up about what somebody else's no means. Mm -hmm. So like you just said, somebody says no to you. Can you hear that as, oh, cool. Okay. So you don't want to do that. You're not up for that. It's a no for you, period. Nothing personal. It's just a no for you. It's got nothing to do with me. Can you take it like that? Or like you said, is it now it's you're questioning your deservedness and your worthiness. And all of a sudden it's throwing you back in your mind to 10 years ago or 30 years ago when something happened and it's like, you're like, it's happening again. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that tells you there's work to be done. That tells you there's something that's not healed. There's something that's not integrated. There's something from your past that's holding you back in your present. And yeah. someone like Kevin, as an example, helps you through that. But if you don't reach out, if you don't have someone to talk to, if you don't have you know the books and the questions and you dive into yourself and you journal and you figure things out for yourself, you know, nothing changes. That's right. It's like using, using the tools to put yourself in uncomfortable situations so that when those co- uncomfortable situations come up, you know what it feels like. You can navigate those. Like your nervous system is like, okay, I know what this feels like. And I can respond in the way that, that I truly want to as, as who I am, not the wounded child or the, you know, the, the egoic response that, that I'm going to, I'm going to just like respond, like, um, you know, like I was taught to Mm -hmm. or told to, or like, or like my, my boss or my dad or my, 
mentor told me to, this is me, right? This is me responding out of me. Um, one thing, uh, one thing that I, I talk to my kids about too, when they ask me for something, and this goes to kind of like hearing no and being triggered by their response is that means that you might be acting or asking with an expectation. So when my kids ask me something, I tell them, are you asking, are you going to be okay with a no? Because if, if you're not, then, then I don't want you to ask a question because if you ask me and I say no, and then you're mad, then you're expecting a different answer. I love that. And mm -hmm. so for everyone listening to build on it, if you're asking with expectation, you're attached to the outcome. And when you're attached to the outcome, you suffer because you're not usually, or half the time at least, or some ver some percentage, you will not get what it is you wanted. <laughs> and if you're attached <laughs> to that outcome, you're going to be disappointed. There's going to be suffering. And you know that's not necessary. It doesn't have to happen. And something that you said earlier, there's a distinction I share with clients, this idea that everything is either an act of love or a cry for help. And for everyone listening, whether it's you thinking about yourself and you're doing the introspection, or it's, you know, you're talking, you're thinking about your partner, you're listening right now and you're thinking, wow, my partner just said or did that thing. And obviously it's, well, which camp is it in? It's not an act of love. Like, so you go, it was a cry for help, but recognize, mm -hmm. like you said, most guys, they're not going to express that if they've been suppressing. So that cry for help is not going to come across like an, like a genuine sincere asking for help it's going to come across like they're feeling defensive or they're going mm -hmm. to attack or things like that they're, they're feeling frustrated and they're getting worked up all that is kind of the superficial side of it but when you dive into that you know it's like it's not what they said it's what's the intention behind it where did that come from yeah you know, there's a visual in my mind that i share with people sometimes imagine just for the sake of this demonstration it's a you know a, a man and a woman let's say there's um, the woman's about to leave. She's going to go to work. And let's say the husband's at home. And let's say the garage is a mess. And the woman says to the husband or you know, the wife says to her husband, hey, could you clean the garage before I get back? And he goes, oh, yeah, I got it. Don't worry about it. And then she comes home and the garage is still a mess. And he kind of comes up with, some, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to it. And then let's say three days later, she's leaving. She notices the garage is still a mess. So she says, hey, honey, can you take care of the garage and clean it up, please, before I get back? Oh yeah, you got it. I'll do it right. I'll do it in five minutes. Then she comes home. It's still a mess like hours later, right? Fast forward a couple of times of doing that coupled with maybe she asked him to do other things and he did the same thing. At one point, this is her version of the suppression. She blows up. Mm -hmm. and she comes home thinking that, gar that, gar that garage better be clean because he said he would do it like 12 times in a row and he hasn't done it. So then she says, she comes in, it's a mess. And then let's say she starts yelling and getting angry. If he's kind of oblivious to the whole thing because they haven't been communicating, he's sitting there going, I don't get it. It's just like the, the garage. It's not a big deal. But yeah. in my mind, it's like, she's, that's not why she's mad. She's mad because she feels like she can't trust you that your word doesn't mean anything because she's mm -hmm. asked you 50 times to do something that you said you would and you broke your word. So she's sitting there going, how can I rely on this man? I don't feel safe. You know, yeah. I can open up. And it's that same kind of thing. It, everything's an act of love or a cry for help. So in this, yeah. in, that, in that visual, the wife gets upset. And if you are armed with this kind of, you know, distinction in your mind, you go, it's clearly not just the grudge. There's something else going on. Like what 100%. part did I play in this? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and you know what? <laughs> to take that on her, on her end a, a little bit deeper too, is she feels unheard. Yeah. And, and unloved right? If her love language is, is acts of service, if he was to just get up and do that, she would feel like she's being loved just by that act, right? Where he, he might, his might be um, uh, physical touch, right? Where he's just like, oh, it's, well, I, I, I said I was going to do it and I'll do it. Um, why are you getting so mad? But he's, and then he's, he's probably, you know, maybe he's thinking, resentful because they're not having sex or being intimate at night right and he's just like what the hell I'm, I'm i'm trying to do all the things that i'm supposed to be doing it's just the garage what's the big deal <laughs> yeah just because you brought it up uh in case anyone's not familiar 
the the five love languages is a book that I definitely uh, recommend anyone read in their relationships. It, Me too. It's really, really great. And to kind of put it real simple, in case you're not going to pick it up, there's in this book's uh, framework, there's five ways that we can all really experience love. And let's see if I can get them all. So we got a, uh, acts of service, like you said, that might be cleaning the garage, taking the garbage out. You're doing something for your partner so they don't have to do it. And then mm -hmm. something maybe that they, oh yeah, I've got 15 things on my plate today. Wow, it's going to be cutting it close. And then without even asking, you took care of four of them for them so that they don't have to do it. And they go, wow, like that's so nice. If that's their primary love language, meaning what the one they value the most, that's going to be how they experience love. And then we've got words of affirmation. This is people who like to hear the love, the appreciation, the praise, the respect, like whatever it is, we want words. Right? We, we mm -hmm. like getting those text messages. We like having our partner look into our eyes and say something really beautiful to us. Then this physical touch, like you said, that could be sex, that could be holding hands, that could be hugging, that could be just a playful touch every now and then. But physical touch is how that kind of person expresses love. Then there's gift giving. And from the gift giving perspective, it doesn't mean like you necessarily buy something, but maybe you made something, but some degree mm -hmm. of a gift. And so, I, I, and then the last one's quality time. And so from quality that time, case, yeah spending that quality time together. And I share it because we've got these five. And in a way, we all want all five in general, but one, two, or three are usually prioritized in our mind. And that's how we love to receive love. The one way you can tell what yours are, think about how you love to give love. <laughs> and the ways you love to give it is usually the same as how you like to receive it. So the question is, what is your partner's top two or three and are you meeting that need to their satisfaction? Because yeah. if, my, if my partner thinks quality time is number one and we're on the couch together watching a movie, but I'm on my phone, if I'm sitting there thinking, oh yeah, you know, we're, we're watching the movie, quality time, because let's say that's not important to me, but in their mind, I'm on my phone, I'm in my head a million miles away. It doesn't matter that we're like an inch apart. We're not spending quality time together. And like That's you said, right. in that visual, if her number one is acts of service and he has his physical touch, he's trying to be intimate at night or whenever, and he's getting frustrated because maybe she's not open to it. So he's thinking she doesn't love me or something. And she's not open to intimacy because she doesn't feel safe or understood or loved because he's not meeting her love language. Yeah. And he's not cleaning the garage because she's not having sex with him at night. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like it's kind of like a vicious circle. And it's, it's so funny. Uh, not funny, but um, how, when I reflect back, how I loved on my partners, my family members, stuff like that in my love language yes, and didn't even know what theirs were, or maybe didn't even recognize that. So it was, uh, you know, reading that book and, and there's a quiz that you can take for like, it takes like five minutes online. I've done it. I've had my partner, Kelly, take it. All of my family, my kids, there's a kid's version just so that I understand, right? My niece, 0% physical touch. Mine's physical touch. So like to give her a hug, she's literally like, Ooh, right? But words of affirmation are hers. So you tell her that you're proud of her or that she's doing a really good job or that her hair looks really pretty. She's literally like melting, right? Yeah. And so a really simple question that people can ask their partner, if you'd like a kind of a starting point. What, when is it that you feel most loved by me? When I do what, you just feel so respected and heard and loved. And they might say, oh, you know, when, when we spent that experience, we, we spent that time together over here, or when you did A, B, and C for me, or when this happened, when that happened. And very often, like you said, if we're not aware of our mm -hmm. partner's love language, you get so much from that conversation just by asking the question, when do you feel most loved by me? And can you give me some examples? And then just listen, and then just do yeah. more of it. <laughs> How can, how can I love you more, right? Yeah. Like, what can I do to, for you to feel love more? Also, so that I can receive love as well. Like, it's a mutual thing. And even like, in, the book is an amazing read and it's super easy to read, but it tell, has stories about people that 25, 30 year relationships that are literally hating each other that just start doing one thing per month. And it literally changes and reconnects them in a way that they never even expected possible. So yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a powerful thing, and it's something that uh, that I talk about a lot, and I, I value it for sure. So one more um, kind of quick book shout out. I think people will really get a lot from. So one is the five love languages. We just talked about that. I think it's Gary Chapman. I think. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. The other one is called nonviolent communication. Mm. And I think it's by uh, Marshall Rosenberg. And just from, we, we, we've been talking a little bit about communication. And I think that book is a gold, it's really simple to read. And it's a gold mine when it comes to con conversing with people that are, you know, anyone, but especially people that matter to you in a way that's not going to lead to conflict. Yeah. And I think that, like you said, and like, like I brought up a few times, we're communicating in ways that are far from optimal and ideal, and it's creating so much pain and suffering in our life. And I just think yeah. those two books can really serve people. Totally. And so I'd love to pivot and ask you, can you please share with us, what is Warriors of the Heart and what is the mission and purpose of that group? So in 2020, um, I, I felt the need to just have real conversations. Um, that was kind of like the, the mission was like, you know, I'm tired of these surface level conversations, lack of connection, um, just feeling like I'm not expressing my true self. And I started to have these real conversations with other men. And it, I would leave those conversations just floating and feeling like amazing. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to start a group and see who else there is out there that just want to have real conversation. But a part of that was, you know, like with COVID kind of like closing the doors on gatherings and public, um, we were going to do it online. So I started a Facebook group called, uh, it was called the safe zone for men. And it was just like, a, I was talking to Kelly, my partner about it. And she's uh, telling her kind of like my idea. And she's like, Oh, it's kind of like a, a safe zone for men. I was like, yeah, exactly. So I'm going to call it that. Right. But, uh, I started this group and it was just like, you know, a space where, where men could be open and share and talk about the things that, that they're challenged with, that they're going through, um, but also their wins, their victories. I feel like a lot of times we don't celebrate the amazingness that we are. And, and a lot of times, you know, the, the good things that we do aren't celebrated because they're, we only reflect back on the negative stuff that's going on. Right. So it was a way to, to, you know, have a group of brothers that could share like podcasts, uh, videos, books that they've read, um, things that have helped them throughout their lives, not just the, the challenges that they're going through, um, but also the things that have helped them along the way so that someone else who's a part of the group can be like, oh, you know, I never even thought to listen to that guy or, you know, that video really helped me or that quote was like something that, that uh, changed my mindset. So that was kind of the, that's kind of the gist of it. And, and it's, it's grown into warrior warriors of the heart because I feel like that's what I am. And that's, you know, that's who you are. You've battled through the layers of armor that are protecting your heart from all of the things that we've been through in our lives, the wounds, the, the pain, the, the, the challenges that we've had to overcome has created this layer of armor that you need to battle through and open that heart up to who we really are mm. and, and, and be that, just be that authentic version of ourselves. So that's, that's really the gist of that. Yeah. There's a visual you just um, said that just, um, it brought something up for me that I share with clients often. This idea that when it comes to being willing to give and receive love. Very often, if we've experienced emotional pain, heartache, heartbreak, whatever version of that, you know, resonates with you, we tend to, out of, you know, preservation, protection, we kind of put a, um, a cage around our heart, let's say, to protect ourselves. For anyone who's watching the video, I kind of have my hands as if I'm like almost like hugging myself and it's, bl it's blocking my heart. So it's like, if you're in front of me, there's a boundary, right? There's something preventing you from let's say getting in mm -hmm. but the other thing it does it prevents me from getting out it prevents my love from coming out and so what i live you know strive to do every single day as well as what i encourage people to do and i'm going to explain this for the people who are only listening but i'm just standing up and i imagine that my hands are in a way almost like handcuffed behind me and because they're handcuffed behind me my heart is just right here and because my heart is right there i now have the possibility of being hurt but the thing is, this is also the only possibility of actually experiencing love. If you're not willing to put yourself out there, if you're not willing to be authentic and vulnerable and actually be seen, mm -hmm. then, you're, then, then you won't ever be loved. Your mask will be loved. 
and people don't know you because they fell in love with your mask. And then years down the road or sooner, your partner says, when you take the mask off, you finally got comfortable. Then, then uh, your partner goes, you've changed. Yeah. And it's not that you've changed. It's that they never knew the real you. But if you're willing to just be authentic from the get-go, and like you said to your kids, are you okay getting a no? Because if I say, you know what, I'm okay with living from that heart-centered, grounded space and putting myself out there and hearing no and not take it personally, not make it mean rejection, and just keep doing that, your life adventure is going to take off in such a beautiful way. But if I've just found that when you come from that space of closing off, one of my mentors, he's a yogi, and he says, we like walls because the walls keep us safe, but we want the door because we want to be able to leave. I love that. The wall of preservation (laughs) imprisons you as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and so are you, do you have that cage around your heart? Have you been burned before? And because of that, and even, even notice, even in my language, I'm going to catch myself there with respect, you haven't been burned before. You have the story about being burned before because being mm-hmm. burned is not a real thing. It's, it's a concept, you know? And That's so right. we have this story around this experience that we had, that we got burned, we got screwed over, this happened, that happened. And because of that, we carry it forward with us. And now you have this, let's say, let's say it's a relationship. You have this new partner in your life. And at some level, you're still projecting out that past baggage onto this new person and saying, Because my old partner did A, B, and C, and I didn't like that, maybe they're going to do it. And now you stop giving them that benefit of the doubt. You stop relating them with them in like a fresh way. And you're seeing them through almost like like using a a glasses metaphor, like wearing glasses. You're Mm -hmm. seeing them through the filter of the old relationships that you had, which isn't fair to them. And it's not fair to you. And it's actually going to be one of the primary reasons why it doesn't work out. That's right. And and so it becomes that self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like that thing that you're afraid of happening is now more likely to happen. But if you can come from that space of, like you said, I'm okay hearing no. I am okay enough, perfect as I am. Doesn't mean, again, I can't improve the whole who Mm -hmm. you are versus who you're being, like I said earlier. But I am okay enough, perfect as I am, regardless of whatever this person's got going on. I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to make the request. I'm going to ask for what I want. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I can always ask somebody else. I can always ask again, like there's more happy times ahead, but it's like being willing to just be seen, being willing to be present. There's this uh, visual that comes to mind. I heard Dr. Wayne Dyer say this. He's like, we're all walking around with this giant bag of manure over our shoulder. Mm -hmm. And that bag is our past. And every now and then we stop because the bag is heavy and we put it down and we reach inside and we pull out the manure and we smear it all over our face. <laughs> and then we say, I, I don't get it. Why does my life smell so bad? <laughs> and this idea of what would happen if you put the bag down and you've got the story of, no, 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 like my past experiences, like I need them because I got to keep myself safe. They're screwing you over. If you put mm-hmm. them down, keep the lesson, keep what you can learn from it, but put the bag down and move forward fresh because the past let you go a long time ago but as long as you hold on to it you keep perpetuating the same crap that you don't want anymore that's right and you know what if if you don't put it down or let it go or work through it so to speak you're going to drag it with you and you're it's going to follow you so you can you can try and change jobs you can try and change relationships you can move cities but what's going to follow you is all of the stuff that you're not letting go of Absolutely. And there's a book by the title, wherever you go, there you are. (laughs) That's right. And I was (laughs) thinking about that. I was thinking about that one. Exactly. And, you know, to touch on that, that analogy about like opening your heart up, um, it's no different than, you know, you scrape your arm, right? How is it going to heal? It's going to heal by exposing itself. You know, it's going to start to heal. The more that you practice doing something, when you open your heart out, it's going to be raw. It's going to hurt. It's going to feel foreign right but the more that you practice it the more that you keep that open and and exposed and and do that that work and speak your authentic in your authenticity and your authentic truth the better you're going to get at it the more authentic you're going to become the better it's going to feel and the more that you're going to attract what you truly want and that's you know that's what you know kind of like the warrior of the heart like 
that's really what it's all about exposing your heart but leaving it open yeah you know it it brings up just this idea of whatever it is you want to get good at it's only going to happen with practice and for the people absolutely and for anyone listening who might say oh i'm not a good listener or oh like I'm not whatever it is that you and I are talking about today that we think they should do, right? <laughs> that mm-hmm. idea, well, you haven't practiced it. That's why you don't think you're good at it. But none of us were good at it. I used to be mm-hmm. one of the world's worst listeners. <laughs> and people frequently now compliment me on my listening. But, oh. <laughs> you know, but I used to be horrible at it. Totally. And I can, I can totally relate to that because I, would, uh, I was what I would call a listen, uh, a listen to responder. Yeah. And, you know, I couldn't wait for somebody else to be done talking because I had something better to say. Right. And it was just like, they would kind of get to a certain spot and I'm like, okay, ears are shut off because I'm ready to talk. Yeah. Right. So I'd either interrupt them or, you know, lose track of what they were saying and uh, just start talking myself. So yeah, definitely I could relate to that. And, and one of the best things that I did was start becoming a better listener. And I sure learned a hell of a lot more. That's for sure. I, th- I forgot who said it, but I think it was uh, Larry King, actually. But this, uh, regardless, the quote is, I never learned anything by speaking. Mm. You know, and I like that. It's real simple. It's beautiful. Um, question for you, Kevin. You know, you have supported and helped so many men through their healing journey over the years. For all the men listening, are there a few things that stand out to you that so many of these men consistently deal with? that you can share that can help anyone who's listening? Um, like things specifically or something that kind of comes up? Yeah, so maybe there's something that comes up. Maybe there's some beliefs that you see consistently that come up. Maybe there's certain practices that are very useful, anything like that. Yeah, uh, something that comes up and I, I went for a run today and this was this like really just like popped into my, my awareness. And that was, it's never too late, you know? we can try and do all of the things and, and we, we play this role in our lives for so long that a lot of times it's like, Oh, I've spent so much time doing that. Like it's too late to change now. You know, here I am, I'm 43 years old. Um, it's too late. You know, I'm, I'm this far, you know, creating change or doing something different. Is it even going to be worth it? Am I worth it? And it's just that old belief where it's like, no, you're absolutely worth it. And the change, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter how old you are or how much time you've put into something. If you want something different, if you want something more, change your belief to believe that you deserve it and are worthy and just take that first step. And it's like the, the first step for me is just, you know, taking a pause and just taking a moment to breathe for yourself. What is it that I want? And what's the next step for me to, to go after that? And it, it could be the, the tiniest thing. I've seen taking that uh, scene in my own life, but also with other people, taking that breath. <laughs> One moment, just take that breath. It can go such a long way. Just pausing before you speak. What we yeah. come to mind is, um, I think I first heard this from like a Buddhist perspective, but just this idea of, is whatever I'm about to say kind? Is whatever I'm about to say respectful is it loving Mm -hmm. and if not on the last one is it necessary yeah is it is it true necessary or kind and if it if it doesn't run through those three filters maybe it doesn't need to be said yes right yeah and then that like you said that pause that breath is where you can ask that question check in before you respond and the more you practice it it can happen in a microsecond or you might need to take five minutes and like go go somewhere else and then respond after but I promise you, whatever time you take to slow down and question what you're about to say, you're probably going to save yourself a whole lot of trouble and heartache and mental anguish. <laughs> yeah, I know that there's a lot of times where I'm like, yes, it's necessary, right? But it's like, <laughs> no, no, that's your ego, buddy. Like, <laughs> slow down and, and or like, I've, I've said it, right? You know, dealing with, with, you know, dealing through a divorce is challenging. And there's a lot of times where I've said and, and done things that, absolutely as soon as i did it i'm like oh man i don't like when i'm like that or when i say those types of things so it's like i'm going to set a boundary for next time and then next time shows up and goes are you going to hold yourself accountable to that 
or what what's going to happen here so yeah it's uh it's been a continuous lesson but i definitely that that true necessary and kind um definitely definitely relates for me for sure yeah for all of the ladies or anyone who's listening they have a a man in their life what have you seen has been so useful for them to know like what what do women or anyone who's got a man in their life typically not know about men because maybe we don't share it um you know it's uh yeah a lot of times i guess for me what comes up is is fear right um we're so i'm gonna just speak from an i statement being me i was so afraid to let people in that i was afraid you know that i didn't know that i didn't have the answers that that uh you know almost like that imposter right i'm like people are going to figure me out yeah um we all have stuff we all have stories we all have feelings and emotions and and to think that as a man or you know like even to speak for myself to to believe that i was different than everybody else with my emotions and not feeling them and not having challenges was just it was it was so wrong and that's that's just something is like you know um we all have feelings we all have emotions we all feel them our stories are maybe completely different but the way that we feel is the same so your dad maybe didn't get you an ice cream cone but he got your brother one and you feel completely abandoned in that moment whereas someone else you know maybe lost a family member or their parent and they feel abandoned in that moment that feeling is the same even though it looks different right you know so it's just there's no scale to that and there's it's all relative and that's something where it's like we all feel that and that's something that that i've noticed in you know the men's circles that i facilitate and have been involved in and that's like yeah we all feel it and there's no there's no measure yeah what's coming up for me right now is this idea that you know in this human experience in this human body we're not machines and so from that perspective whoever your partner is whoever is listening or whoever they will be if you don't have one right now checking in with them and holding space you know seeing how they're doing seeing if they need anything using some of those questions we asked earlier you know you know it's like a what is it that makes you feel most loved by me? Can you give me some examples? Yeah. How could I help you feel more of that? You know, it's like what well, oftentimes when people don't feel really safe, like Kevin said, we don't open up. Mm -hmm. If we're not opening up, it's not because I'm just a closed off person. It's like, no, <laughs> people have these like static personalities that they think are permanent. It's like, no, you don't feel safe. That's why you're not opening up. You think that if you open up, your partner's going to leave you. You think that if That's you right. share it with your friend, they're not going to be friends with you anymore. You think that if you ask for that promotion, you're going to get fired. You know, it's like you've got these stories that you run with and they keep you blocked. They keep you playing small. And so just, again, we're not machines. Obviously, any man who's been buying into that life philosophy of, you know, stuff the emotions, suppress them, don't show the emotions, vulnerabilities, weakness, all that kind of stuff. If you're the partner of that kind of man, slowly but surely, day by day, creating that space that opportunity for him to open mm -hmm. up and as he opens up it's just going to deepen that connection so much more because the intimacy the depth the trust all that is going to skyrocket so the connection is going to dramatically improve because at the end of the day i remember i learned this from tony robbins when i was i think 15 the core <coughs> excuse me the core like fears the core wounds that we have is that i'm not enough and i won't be loved mm -hmm. And fast forward to now with the work I've done with people, with the neuro-linguistic programming and the hypnotherapy and all, the emotional release work, there's essentially four or five primary beliefs that we, we all have some degree of these. And it's, I'm not enough. I'm not lovable. I'm not worthy. I don't matter. You know, variations of that. And mm -hmm. when you realize, wow, my partner, going back to everything's either an act of love or a cry for help, they seem to be exuding a lot of cry for help behavior. Well, they probably have aspects of what I just said going on that they're not even aware of. 
and they're afraid. And if you can hold that space, not trying to get something from them, trying to give them the gift of the presence, mm -hmm. give them the gift of the connection, give them the gift of just that opportunity to just open up, let the, put the bag down, let the weight go. It's incredible the connection and the trust that is built. Have you experienced that as well? Absolutely, 100%. And that's where it's like, you know, sometimes to create that safe space, it takes you opening up, yeah. right? So whether it's, you know, whether it's the, the female or the male or, you know, who, whatever side of the relationship, male, male, um, female, female, right? Just create, that's the way of creating that safe space is to be like, you know what? Um, I'm not feeling loved or this is how I'm feeling. And that brings those walls down because we haven't been taught that it's okay to talk like that. Yeah. Or that, you know, here's how we hold space like that and listen to that. Because, you know, one thing that I found is the truth hurts to, to, to say, but it also hurts to hear. So a lot of times we don't want to hear it. So that's why it just gets buried, right? But being able to, to just have that vulnerability and be like, you know what? And maybe it's just starting small. It's like, you know what? Right now, I'm scared. or I, you know, I'm worried about the future because of this or whatever that opens the door and brings those walls down for more honest, open and vulnerable communication. And you're right. That is where true connection lies. If you can have that safety to do that, there's, there's nothing like it. I have felt it and there's nothing like it. And, and the goosebumps are, are, are confirmation, right? Yeah. Um, one thing that's really helped too, for me, but also with, with men that I work with, write it down, you know, write some things. If there's something that, that you really feel like you need to say, I can guarantee there probably is right. Um, write it down, read it out to your partner, set time, create that time and space is like, you can fit an hour, right? Somewhere. I'd like to talk to you about something. Um, what time works for you? You know, it may not sound intimate, but you know, it's important to, to set time for those. Um, just if I can keep going for one second, one thing that Kelly and I do, my partner and I, we set up two date nights per week for each other. And one, and they're not elaborate. They're just, you know, even for just an hour, one of them is for talking about the hard things, the things that we need to discuss, the challenges, the, you know, the, the, the real tough stuff that we, the real life issues. We set it time aside to, to talk about those, but we do that for an hour because it, it is easy to kind of get stuck in that sludge and, and talk about that, you know, dumping on each other all the time. But then we also set a date night where it could only be an hour again. And like I said, it doesn't have to be elaborate, but we talk about the fun, about our connection, about the things that we want, how much how much we love each other, the, the things that we want to do with our lives, our dreams, our goals, like filling our cups up with the things that we want to do and the people that we want to want to be around. And, and uh, it's just, it's such a beautiful perspective that, you know, setting the intentions and like you set the intention at the beginning of this call, people don't trust themselves to set intentions and follow through on them. And that's what I've really realized is setting small intentions and following through just sets yourself up for success in life. Mm. I love that. I want everyone to, who's listening to notice that Kevin and Kelly have practiced, you know, they've put a lot of time in these date nights are intentional. They're very deliberate about what's going to be in each date night. And so you might be listening saying, we don't have any date nights. So I don't know when the mm -hmm. last time you had one was, or, or like, we don't, we're not good at that. <laughs> it's like, it's a practice. It's something that yeah. schedule it, commit to it, do it together. And don't expect it to be, let's say, quote unquote, perfect on the first try. It will be perfect as it is for what it is. But like mm -hmm. you said about setting the intention, you know, when I'm, when I'm sharing, when I talk with some of my clients about communication, a lot of it's in that nonviolent communication book that I recommended earlier. But as an example, imagine you say to your partner, Hey, I've got something on my heart that I want to share with you that I think will really help our relationship. Um, I need about 40 minutes. When do you have time for that? And then, so now it's not just, hey, we need to talk. It's like, th there's that preface of it'll help our relationship, which your partner is probably going to say, oh, great. Like, like I, I'd like yeah. that. 
And then in the conversation, it's not blaming, but it might be something like, hey, so I've been feeling this for a while and I'm not sure why and I'd like your help solving this. So now it's you and me versus the problem. I'm not attacking you for anything. Yeah, I, I love that. I really believe in my heart that you love me. And for whatever the reason, I haven't been feeling loved. Can I share with you some of the things that I have most enjoyed, the things that I have felt most loved by you up until this point? And your partner cares about you. Your partner's probably going to say, please do. And mm -hmm. then they share, oh, well, this, this, this. And now they know, okay, I'll do stuff like that more. And then you talk it out. And it's not about, you know, you didn't do this. And pe people get defensive when they feel they're being attacked. And then you're not going to have a great conversation. And so, yeah, it's uh, there's so much we can open in. But I know. Totally. Like, yeah, 100%. And, and like I said, too, it doesn't have to be anything a lot, super elaborate. You know, we'll go for a walk. We'll go grab a tea from the coffee shop and, and just, you know, drive around, talk about our, you know, talk about where we want to live, you know, what we want to do, you know, what we see for the kids, you know, things like that. Um, and then, yeah, like maybe we go for dinner, but it doesn't have to be about spending money or like dressing up or doing a big fancy thing and going to like a hotel. It doesn't have to be anything super elaborate like that, although that's amazing. Right. Yeah. But, you know, to, to keep it intentional and to, to hold yourself accountable and follow through on it, you know, start small. Yeah. And it brings up in my mind, like what we've talked about a couple of times and we've alluded to it several other times. It's not about, like you said, you know, how much money you're spending, how elaborate it is. It's the connection. Yeah. You could spend a ton of money going out to some really expensive restaurant and get, come home and yeah, you ate dinner, but it wasn't a date. Like you didn't have that depth or quality of connection you feel, even though they were three feet away from you, maybe you still felt just as absent or you That's can just right. on the couch and have a conversation that goes to such a depth that allows both people to feel seen and heard and respected and loved that that 30 minutes, 40 minutes, three hours, whatever it was, that mm -hmm. is infinitely better, perhaps. With the Absolutely. Point is that your goal is. 100%. And, and you know what? I do that with my kids as well, right? I split 50-50 time with my ex-wife and and when I have them on Tuesdays, it's my daughter's date night. And on Thursdays, it's my son's. And, you know, we might go shoot hoops or play road hockey with my son. Um, maybe we'll just go for a walk or go like get a donut, coffee and a donut. My daughter really likes going to the library or baking. So we'll do, you know, we'll do something like that, but it's intentional. They know that it's coming. And when you have that, give your kids that complete presence, it's like, like I said, only for an hour, even hour and a half, the things that come through are things that you would never, you would never expect or do by doing all of the activities or just like taking them and keeping them busy all the time. Yeah. 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 And so as we begin to wrap up our time together today, Kevin, you know, the purpose of this podcast is to help people create an extraordinary life without regret. Mm -hmm. What advice were you, would you have, or do you have for anyone who would like to do that? Man, that's, uh, I love that question because one of the things that I reflect on so much is my last day. You know, like I put myself on the last day that I'm here on this earth and think about what would I do today? What could I do? What could I say? What's a conversation that I haven't had? What's something that I would do for myself in this moment? that if today was my last day, I would be okay. I would be, I can accept that today's my last day. And you know what? I lived a pretty good life and I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm good. I'm good yeah. on the inside. So that's, uh, that's something that I reflect on. And, and you know what? If, if something comes up where it's not good or it's scary or it brings up like fear, anxiousness, maybe that's where your work is. You know, that's where the, the next step is, right? And that's, you know, a lot of what I help people with is, you know, let's find that next step. Let's create a, intentions and, and, you know, accountability on, on how to take those. And I'm here for support with whatever you need. Yeah. Wonderful. And so what is the biggest risk that you've taken that you're deeply grateful for and why? Oh, man. I, uh. I, when I worked in oil and gas, I used to make $200,000 a year, just about. And, you know, when I, uh, I decided that I was going to, you know, jump into coaching full time, um, that was the scariest 
most rewarding thing that I'd done. And even still, like there's, you know, it just, it brought up so much in me that, that I was still attached to like the, the status and the things and, and all of that. But I'm like, man, I knew that I knew that I couldn't go one foot in one foot out. So I made that, that choice and the decision to, you know, go hundred percent into it, but also like wanting to, to really focus on, on getting through my divorce and, and uh, setting myself up for the future and my ex for the future and, and my kids as well. So, you know, I attacked that full force and, and jumped into, into this coaching because I just saw so many people that were just like me that didn't have a space or didn't feel like they had a space to talk. And I wanted to create that for them. So it's, uh, it's been pretty powerful. Lots of lessons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So what are you excited about now that you're working on? Uh, right now, um, I got my website that's coming up here soon. I just, uh, I've been working with another coach who we've collaborated on a, on a business venture as well. Um, she created a logo for me and I'm like super excited about it. So, you know, the website's coming up, uh, just really trying to lean into, you know, to, you know, creating, um, and having, having fun with it and, you know, like social media and doing more podcasts and, and, uh, making some videos that, that really try and spread this message and, you know, work with as many men as possible and, and really just create that community of, you know, consciously aware brothers. Yeah. So for anyone listening who would like to connect with you, who wants to find ways to work with you, what are the best ways to, to contact you and to check out all, all the things that you're offering? For sure. Um, definitely, you know, check out the, the Warriors of the Heart uh, private men's group online on uh, Facebook. Um, they can, they can find me on Instagram at warriors of the heart and heart, heart is spelt, uh, oh, sorry, heart is spelt H dot E dot A dot R dot T. So it's warrior of the heart. You can find it on there. Um, my email is KM at heart dash warriors.com. So that's through email and, uh, yeah, the website's coming soon. Beautiful. And I'll have all the links to that in the show notes so everyone can click them easy and, and find it. Uh, so for everyone listening, if you enjoyed our conversation today, first of all, thank you so much for being with us. It, it means a lot. You know, it's so fun, selfishly for me to film these episodes. I love having conversations with amazing people and to get to share that with every one of you is just, it's a blessing. And so if you're enjoying these, please leave a review. It does really help whether it's on Apple or Spotify or anywhere you're listening to this. And also please subscribe so you find out when new episodes come out and you don't miss those. Is there anything you'd like to say before we close, Kevin? Uh, just the, you know, it's these conversations, Jamil, as, as you know, that, that truly has a level of healing power. So, you know, anyone who's out there, uh, just start a conversation and, you know, talk, talk about what's really going on. Ask questions and truly listen and, and just, Feel what it's like. Yeah, it's uh, there's nothing like it. Mm, yeah, for sure. At the start of our conversation today, I shared that my life's work is to help leaders, champions, and high performers experience more happiness, peace, and fulfillment as they create an extraordinary life without regret. If there's any support I can give you, if you'd like to have a conversation, I'd love to speak with you, see what we can build and create as you go towards the life that you'd love to live. You can connect with me at jamilsayage.com. And if you're looking for more podcasts, different posts, I put out probably 800 pieces of content or more over the last six, seven years on social media, Instagram and Facebook at Dr. Jamil Syed, DR and then my name on Instagram and just Jamil Syed on Facebook and LinkedIn. I'll have the, the notes for that as well as everything Kevin shared in the show notes below. Thank you again for being with us, Kevin. Truly appreciate you, brother, and all the work that you do in the world and the men and the lives that you change. Thank what you, I brother. What I have found is that most people's favorite day to change their life is tomorrow. And that's why they stay stuck. But you can be different. For you, transformation can start today. Any nuggets of wisdom that you pulled from today's podcast, listen to it again. Take notes, apply. Ask yourself, what would my future self thank me for? Then go do that. You'll be happy you did. Create a meaningful day. All my love. Thank you for being with us today. If this conversation served you, it would mean a lot if you left a review and shared this with anyone who may benefit. An extraordinary life without regret is available to you now. Choose it. It's your time.